Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at an awesome little mini desktop known as the Elite Mini H31G from Menace Forums. Now you might be familiar with the company who's manufacturing this because recently they put out the Desk Mini, which was an AMD Ryzen powered mini PC. I've done a review on it. And overall, it's an awesome little machine, but the H31G, which we're gonna be taking a look at in this video, definitely has a beat because this is actually equipped with the NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti and a desktop class Intel 9th generation CPU. And as you can see here, it's still a very small form factor. It is bigger than the Desk Mini, but we're working with a lot more power here on the GPU side and the CPU side. But before we get started here, I do want to mention that this was sent over by Menace Forum. I'm not being paid to make this review, nor is anybody going to review it before it goes live. They simply sent this over for a review, and that's what I'm going to do. So inside of the box of the H31G, you're going to receive a little dust filter, the PC itself, a user manual, we'll get the VESA mount, we also have a couple HDMI cables, one's HDMI to DisplayPort, and the power supply itself, which is a 150 watt power supply, and when we add this to the H31G, it does make the total volume of the unit a bit bigger, but I usually don't count the power supply and the total size of the PC itself, because it usually sits behind my desk, but even if we added this to the H31G, it's still a super tiny PC, given the power that this thing's putting out. So if we take a look at the front of the unit, there's not much going on here except for the power button. There's also a power LED and a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. Over on the right hand side, it's pretty plain Jane, but we do have some ventilation here for the CPU and GPU combo. Moving to the left hand side, we have our micro SD card slot and more audio jacks. And around the rear, we have our power input, full-size HDMI, mini display port, and four USB 3 ports. Unfortunately, this does not include USB Type-C whatsoever. And as for the specs on the unit that we're going to be taking a look at in this video, we have the i5-9500F, we have 6 cores with a base clock of 3 GHz and a boost up to 4.4, an NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti, 8 GB of DDR4 RAM running at 2400 MHz, and this does have Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.1. Now this was just the specs of the one I received, but they do offer a few different options. You can get this without a CPU, without RAM or SSD. You can also opt for the i3-9100F, the i5-9400F, the i5-9500F, which we have here, and the i7-9700F, without RAM or storage, all the way up to 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of storage. And speaking of storage, this will actually support a 2.5 inch drive. We also have a micro SD card slot, an M.2 2280 slot, and an M.2 2242 slot. So we do have a lot of options to add storage to these devices. So far, I've been having a really good experience with this unit. I did run a few benchmarks. First up, we have our M.2 benchmark. Now for this not being an NVMe, speeds aren't bad at all for an included M.2 drive. Next up, we have Geekbench 5, single core, 1195, multi-core, 4498. Remember, we have six cores here with that i5-9500F. And finally, I moved over to some GPU benchmarks with 3 Mark. First up, we have Fire Strike, total score, 6572. And while I was there, I went ahead and ran a Time Spy, total score on this, 2502. So yeah, everyday performance on this little machine is definitely some of the best that I've seen out of a PC at this form factor, and rightly so. I mean, we have that desktop class processor and the GTX 1050 Ti, but I still wanted to test a few things, because if somebody picks this up, they're also going to want to use it as a desktop PC. Most of our time is spent online, so I did want to test a few things here. We have WebGL samples. You can check this out on your own PC. Really impressed here. From 100 all the way up to 20,000, I'm still getting... 60 FPS, but at 25,000 starts to dip a bit. Still not bad at all, and if I go all the way up to 30, we're still around 46 FPS. So WebGL performance out of this little machine is great. Another thing I wanted to check out was media consumption, and while a lot of people won't be running this at 4K, I still wanted to test it. So here we have Big Buck Bunny, 4K. On the initial load in, we had seven drop frames but this will play 4K video just fine across the board. So if you did want to use this as an everyday PC for everyday web browsing, photo editing, and even video editing, this little thing would work out really well. But now it's time to jump into some PC gaming and see how this thing really performs. So first up, we have Subnautica, 1080p, medium settings, and with each one of these games, I will have Afterburner running up in the top left-hand corner, the name of the game, resolution, and the settings used for each game. 
I got about 20 to 30 seconds for each one of these games. I just wanted to give you a feel for how it would perform for you if you did pick one of these up. And Subnautica is a game that me and my son like playing, so I figured I'd throw it in here. Next up, we have Fall Guys. Totally maxed out at 1080p. We're getting 60 FPS and you could play this all day long. Still one of my favorite games of all time. We have Skyrim, but this is the special edition version. 1080p, high settings, it's locked at 60. So I always have trouble with Afterburner and Forza Horizon 4, so I usually just run the built-in benchmark. Medium settings, 1080p, we achieve 74 FPS on average. Here we have GTA 5, and initially I was just going to go with normal settings, but I was able to do a mix of high and normal settings here at 1080p, and performance is absolutely amazing. We're getting over 100 FPS on average, and it's definitely fully playable. Here's Doom Eternal, 1080p, medium settings, and on average I was getting 72 FPS with this by the end of my run. Finally, we have Crisis. This is the new remastered version, 1080p, and unfortunately I did have to take this down to low settings to get over 60 out of it, and by the end of this, I was only averaging 59 FPS. Alright, so far with PC gaming, I'm really impressed here. I think it did an amazing job given the form factor of this little device, but now I think it's time to move on to some emulation. Now when it comes to emulation on a device like this, the lower end stuff is going to run just fine. From NES, N64, PSP, and even Dreamcast, Dreamcast will be able to do 4K on this machine. So I'm going to skip those for this video, and we're going to move right on to the Dolphin emulator, PS2, PS3, and Wii U. I think this is going to handle a lot of it really well. First up, we have some GameCube using Dolphin, and I'm using the OpenGL back in. I didn't even have to switch it to DirectX 11 or Vulkan, and I was able to upscale to 1440p, and even with this game, which is a harder one to run, Automodelista, we're at full speed. So seeing how this game performs, we're going to move right on to Wii. Here we have Sonic Colors, 1440p, OpenGL back in, again, full speed with this one. Having no issues whatsoever with the Dolphin emulator. Moving over to PS2 with PC SX2, OpenGL back in, upscaled to 1080p, and Gran Turismo 4 is running at full speed, so are the other games that I tested with this emulator. So far, emulation on this device has been an absolute treat, but I do think we need to move up a little more, so we're going to go to Wii U using the SimU emulator. Here we have Breath of the Wild using the Vulcan back end, 
And this emulator's come a long way. The developers have done an amazing job here. As you can see, we're at 60 FPS with this small form factor PC, but every once in a while you will see it dip down a bit. I believe that's my shaders being cached in the background. And to tell you the truth, I didn't do much setup with this game here. There's a lot of little tweaks you can do to get this to run even better than this. And finally, at least for this video, we have PS3 using RPCS3, Vulcan backend, Skate 3, running really great. We still have those audio issues and it really comes down to the emulator itself, but this is definitely a harder PS3 game to emulate and I think this machine is doing an amazing job. So before I wrap this video up, I did want to talk about temps, fan noise, and power consumption. So the highest I saw this CPU go was 88 degrees Celsius. I've had core temp running since I started my testing. I think it's doing a pretty good job here, but the fan curve can definitely use some tuning. When this hits about 84 degrees Celsius, you'll hear that fan come on, it'll ramp up for a second, and then cut right back down. I wish it was kind of a smooth curve, but this is how they have it set up out of the box. It's kind of got a flutter to it, so it goes up and down real quick. I really wish it would just ramp down a lot smoother, but other than that, under normal tasks, you really can't even hear this thing. I'm actually running Prime 95 in the background here. And as for power consumption, I did test this at idle, 4K video playback, and 1080p gaming. I'm using a kilowatt meter from the wall, and this is in watts. So yeah, I mean, this is an awesome little mini PC, one of the best ones that I've ever tested on my channel, at least a pre-built mini PC, and it's absolutely tiny. I just want to give you a quick look here. Here's a Raspberry Pi 4 compared to the size of the H31G. Now, as pricing goes, these do range a bit. You can get one with no RAM, no storage, or CPU for $399, or you can go all out with it and get it fully loaded with 16 gigabytes of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, and an i7-9700F, for $879. So yeah, these are a bit pricey, and that's really how it's always been for these super small form factor gaming PCs. So that's pretty much it for this video. Really appreciate you watching. If there's anything else you want to see running on the H31G, just let me know in the comments below. I'd also like to know what you think about this little machine. Of course, it would have been a lot better with a GTX 1650 or a 1650 Super, but I think they still did a pretty good job with the setup they have right now. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.